The title of today's message is, Are You Coming? Are you coming? No, you don't even know what, no, what you're coming to. Uh, let's see. Let me, uh, let me start this sermon uh, with a question. Let me ask you once. I want you to be uh, honest with this answer. Answer in your own hearts, please. Uh, if or when the United States uh, play against South Korea, uh, like in the Olympics, or maybe the World Cup, if the United States played against South Korea, who do you root for? Who do you root for? I can see some of you, um, your answers. I can see it. And I can see that some of you, um, yeah, uh, we all probably have our answers. But listen, wherever you might be from, or you, wherever you might be or from, or your ethnic background, let me ask you, do you still cheer for the United States or from wherever you're from? For me personally, I struggle with this question for many years. Uh, basically, uh, my identity crisis. I was born in Korea, but I grew up here in the United States. I also went back to Korea for about 10 years, roughly. And so my patriotism, my nationalism, my loyalty to a certain country or nation is pretty <laughs> screwed up. Honestly, it's a coin toss. It just depends on how I feel. I feel bad saying this because I know I've reaped a lot of benefits from this country here in the United States. And so I'm very thankful for this nation. I'm thankful for the freedom that I have here. I am. But when I look into the mirror, it's not that I don't feel American, but I always have to add that hyphen. You know what I mean. If you grew up in the United States, you know what I mean. Korean hyphen American. That's who I am. But I don't even feel like I'm Korean hyphen American because when I went to Korea, no matter what I did or no matter what I tried to do, it always came down. They always looked at me as saying, you're American. When I order a Coke uh, for a meal in a restaurant, they say, it's because you're American. Let me ask you Americans who are here, who orders Coke every time you eat a meal? Nobody. I'm pretty sure most of you drink water. But in Korea, they say, I drink Coke because I'm American. Here in the United States, I'm always racially profiled as AAPI. That's who I am, Asian American Pacific Islander. Now, I wish I was from the Pacific Islands, <laughs> no. but I'm never just American. I'm never just American. Even in the last, uh, a few years ago, when I, when I was living in, um, in Virginia, I, I saw, we were going to a supermarket for some groceries, and some high school kids uh, in the distance screamed out these words, go back home. That's what they screamed out, go back home. Uh, well, and I did respond. I said, after I shop. Now, I'm not going through any kind of identity crisis right now. I'm not. I've been through it already when I was growing up here as a young kid. I know who I am. I am so thankful for Jesus. Aren't you? I'm so thankful for Jesus because Jesus, because of Jesus, I know who I am. Because of Jesus, I know where I belong and I know whose I am. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be fostered here in this nation and in this world. And I think I have well acclimated myself here, even to the point I might say that I'm well assimilated into this culture and in this nation and, of course, in this world. But you know what? The reality for me is I can't wait till I get home. I'm not talking about home over in Shalfon, Pennsylvania. I'm talking about home, the eternal home in the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? As a son of God and as a daughter of God, when we read the Bible from the beginning, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, you realize and I'll realize that God, that God is here collecting and gathering his children. That's what he's doing if we understand from Genesis to Revelation. No wonder he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins and mine. Because he's gathering his children. Why? To bring them home, our eternal home, permanent home in the kingdom of heaven. And so we see and we read in the Bible God promising Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He says, Abraham, go. Go where? Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, he tells him. Obviously, the promised land that he's talking about. And he says, and 
I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's what he said. The promise, this covenant that God makes with Abraham is not a promise to make a name of Abraham, even though that's what it sounds like. It's not making Abraham's name great, but it's the plan that God has for his children, and you will see, as I see, this covenantal promise unraveling all throughout the Old Testament and into through the New Testament era today. That is why the very first verse of the New Testament here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, says the name, the name above all of the names Jesus, right, comes from the family line of Abraham. There it is. When God promised Abraham a great nation, you and I, when we read that, we might be quick to think or imagine a nation like maybe the United States of America. But the great nation that God is talking about here to Abraham is not like this, but it's his kingdom come. And when Jesus came, as you know, and uh, when he first started his earthly ministry here on, in this world, his first words were what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, or is at hand. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, the very last book of the Bible, chapter 3, verse 12 says, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave and I'll write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Brothers and sisters, the point here is this. You are not Korean. You are not American. You're not Mexican. I don't care what you are. You are citizens of the Most High God and His kingdom. Amen? Do you believe this? You are part of this. You are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and so now you are sons and daughters of the Most High King of Kings. The Jews, however, the Jewish people, the Israelites, thought this great nation that was promised to Abraham was going to be a physical nation. They were thinking that it's going to be a political powerhouse of a nation that rules over all of the nations on the earth. They thought that it's going to be a military powerful nation. They thought Abraham's name was going to be great. And so that's why his name means father of many nations. They took that literally. And so when the later on in history of God's people, which is actually today's passage's background, the Assyrian Empire all of a sudden came in into the northern kingdom of Israel, as you know, God's uh, uh, nation is split right now from the north and south, right? So when the Assyrian Empire came in and overtook the northern empire of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah thought, what would you think if you were a part of the southern kingdom? This is what I would thought, just like what they did. Thought, well, they're not the ones who are going to be the great nation. They're, they're being taken captive, right? They're, not the, they're being cursed by God. So some nation, some Gentile nation came and took over them. I guess we're going to be the great nation. That's what they probably thought. But some time later, not too long later, the Babylonian Empire came in, right, and they overtook the Assyrian Empire. And not only that, they came down to the southern kingdom of Judah and into Jerusalem, and they took also the southern kingdom of Judah into exile. Now it's not Assyrians, it's the Babylonians that took it. The funny thing is, the prophets were prophesying about this, that this is going to happen. They were prophesying way before any of this actually happened. They were warning God's people that if they do not stop their uh, idolatry, and if they do not stop uh, their disobedience to God, that they will be exiled for 70 years. And guess what? The prophecy came true. Right, the prophecy came, and the entire people of God, both northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, are now taking captivity into exile. And I hope you're with me. Look, it must have been devastating for this people. Right, I, I just can't imagine uh, people. We we have a family here who 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 have been recently coming out as refugees from Ukraine. 
I can't imagine that, to leave everything behind, right, to, co- to, to find, uh, to find uh, uh, safety, right? It's just un- unimaginable for me. But the prophecy came true. Devastating. But listen, the prophecy doesn't end there. It's not just you will be exiled and period. That's not all it is. There's more. You see from Jeremiah the prophet, and I hope you're listening, tells the people in Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 6 and 7, this is what he says. I'm going to read it for you. I will set my eyes on them, and I will bring them back to this land, and I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them out. I will give them a new heart that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. That's the prophecy that Jeremiah gives in 24, verse 6 and 7. And then a little later after that, in Jeremiah chapter 25, the next chapter, he continues his prophecy, and this is what he says. Then, after 70 years are completed, the seven years of exile, I will, this is God speaking, Punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity, for their sins. And what happened? It came true. How? Out of nowhere, another empire comes into the scene. The, the, what is it? The, what is it? Uh, the guy named Cyrus in our passage today, the king of Persia comes in, comes along and he sweeps off the Babylonian empire. Takes over the entire empire, the nation, the region, all the way up to, the, uh, to India. And in the first year of King Cyrus's reign, verse 1 of our passage today that we read, Ezra tells us that Jeremiah's prophecy is coming true. King Cyrus made an edict over all his kingdom, telling all the Jews to go back home and rebuild that temple in Jerusalem. He tells them to go back home, Right? It was the, tell them to rebuild the temple that the Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed. Ezra tells us that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. And not only does King Cyrus let them go back to their homeland, uh, this unbelieving pagan king gives praise to the God of Israel and even gives the people tools, gold, silver, just everything that they need, the supplies, Um, to be able to rebuild the temple. Now we know from God's word, all of this was in God's plan. Just as the prophets were prophesying way before any of this happened. But in a historical standpoint, stay with me, all this would make sense for Cyrus because for Cyrus, he didn't want to be a tyrant. The Persian way of governing and ruling, if if we understand history, was to give religious freedom. Uh, many different kinds of freedom and even partial autonomy for their government. In other words, the Persian Empire was really a great empire because although they had ultimate authority, they wanted their subjects, the people that are uh, uh, they're, they're ruling, to be happy. Now, here's something that would, I think, b- would blow your mind as it blew my mind preparing this message. Over a hundred years, Before all this happened, here in Ezra chapter 1, before this, 100 years before, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, he prophesies, and this is what God says through Isaiah in Isaiah 44, verse 28. It's really mind-blowing. Isaiah 44, verse 28 says this. God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Now, this is of Cyrus. Brothers and sisters, Cyrus Cyrus wasn't even born. He wasn't even born at the time. What's more crazy is Isaiah didn't even know about the existence of Persian Empire because it didn't exist. Amazing. The name is there. So some people say it might have been a different Cyrus at the time. No. No. You read the verse. I read it for you. Now, if you're more interested about this, there's more. In Isaiah chapter 45, the next chapter, that it talks a lot more about the Persian Empire that doesn't even exist, didn't even exist during Isaiah's time. Now, with that, now here Cyrus is financially funding the project to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. 
and when he made the proclamation for all the Jews to go back. What do you think? Let's say we were living, you know, we were the, the Jews living in Persia. What would you think when you heard this king's edict that all the Jews can go back home now and rebuild your whole mother country? You would think that all the Jews would be so happy and celebrating and they would get all their things packed up and, and get ready to go. Right? Wouldn't you be excited that you can go back home? Home. Where's home? Listen, it's been 70 years. 70 years is a long time. My parents immigrated only roughly around 50 years. It's been 50 years. And they might consider U.S. to be their home. Their stay here is longer than their stay when they stayed in Korea. So like, listen, listen to the response in verse 5. Then rose up the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin, the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Listen, that's not everyone. That's my point here. In verse 5, that's not everyone. Where's the tribe of Gad? Where's the tribe of Reuben, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph? They're not there. You know and I know that there are 12 tribes, 12 of them. But we only see in our verse 5 here, only three tribes are mentioned. And not, it's not even the entire tribe that's leaving. Ezra chapter 2, the next chapter, we're in chapter 1 right now. Ezra chapter 2 tells us the exact numbers of people of each tribe. And that when you add it all up, it doesn't even add up to around 50,000. At that time in history, as you, you might know this, that there were a million Jews living in Persia, in the Persian Empire. So 50,000 is ripe, roughly 5%. It's a very small number. Very small portion of the total Jews in Persia. In other words, most of the people decided to stay. The Bible, or in the book of Ezra, doesn't tell us why they didn't want to go, but I'll bet, and I can guess, you can do as well, why they didn't want to. First of all, this journey from the Persian Empire all the way back to Jerusalem is a 900-mile journey. 900 miles. They don't have cars. It's 900 miles on foot. And so somebody calculated this, and it takes about a little over four months to get from the Persian Empire all the way to Jerusalem. The terrain, it is not flat. It is mountainous. It's going up the hill and down into the valley over and over again. The weather is not very nice. The road back to Jerusalem is filled with also bandits, robbers. There are no police on the road. I mean, they're carrying what? Remember, we read it together. They're carrying 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, etc., etc. But it's not just that the journey is rough. Listen, we know from historical evidence that the Jews living in Persian Empire were pretty acclimated to the society. And they have pretty much assimilated into their culture and their ways. And so most of their young generation, next generation, would consider themselves Jewish hyphen Persian. Right? They wouldn't say, or maybe even just Persian. It's been roughly around 50 years for my parents to immigrate here, and right now we're already seeing fourth, fifth generation Korean Americans being born. It hasn't been 70 years yet for us. So why would they leave their home in Persia to go to Judah? Would you? Not only that, can you imagine how Jerusalem would have looked like at the time? It would have been in rubbles, in ruins. The Assyrian Empire came in and destroyed it. Babylonian Empire came in and destroyed it even more. There's no house waiting for them. There's no hotels there, hotel inn or holiday inn. There's nothing for them, nothing for them after the 900-mile walk. And so the majority of the Jewish people just decided to stay in Persia. But listen, those whose spirit God had stirred to go got up and made their way. What does that mean? 
those who heard the voice of God, they went. Who here is hearing the voice of God? Who here understands what God has in store for their lives? In other words, these people who settled there in, in Persia, they forgot. They don't remember God's word. They don't remember the promises he made. All those prophets of the past years who've been prophesying previously, over and over again, they haven't, they forgot. They're just satisfied to be in Persia. God spoke through these pro his prophets. His word was proclaimed and his prophecy was delivered. Yet when the people, instead of fulfilling this promise or this prophecy, because that's what they were supposed to do, they were supposed to go back and fulfill this prophecy. But they just decided to stay. Tells me, as I was telling you, they forgot. They didn't want to, they didn't want to hear the message. They didn't know the message. They didn't care about the message. What was better? Their comfortable lives, their ways of life, their home, their, I mean, I don't know about you, their wealth, their position, status. Listen, God's not only in the back burner. Right now, as we can see, God is abandoned. They rejected God. Brothers and sisters, the prophecies made hundreds of years before the time of Ezra are now being fulfilled through our passage today. Before their very eyes, yet they are blind. They're not able to see it. They're not able to hear it. They don't have the ears to hear it. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? Today, we have prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Today. Jesus is returning. If you believe this, amen. Jesus is returning. Do you believe that? There will be judgment day. Many souls are still lost today. Nations and places where the gospel still has not, has not been heard. Yet we live as if this country, this world, Philadelphia, is our permanent home. We are more proud of being American than being a child of God. How many of us are embarrassed to pray in public? How many of you had a time where you're on the bus, if you get on a bus and open up the Bible, but you feel uncomfortable? Brothers and sisters, God is not silent today. He is speaking very loudly in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is still stirring the hearts of his people all around the world. Listen, are you afraid the journey might be difficult? Are you afraid of the uphill battles in your lives? Afraid of leaving everything behind because, oh man, it's just akawa. Afraid to lose everything. And you might. That might be true. But brothers and sisters, we need to remember one thing. Who is calling you? Who's calling you? Another question is, who are you? Whose do you belong to? Where do you belong? If you could answer that confidently, praise the Lord. Listen, the message is not that you need to move. That's not the message here today. But here it is. Here's the message. Are you ready to do whatever the Lord commands? Is your heart ready, whole heart ready to do what he commands? I'm done. I read to you Revelation chapter 3 verse 12 earlier, but let me read to you again. And I'm going to add one verse and we're done. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I'll write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. Here's the next verse. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, she who has an ear, let her hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So my final question is this. Are you coming? 
Are you coming? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Amen.